Okay, I really appreciate it, John and Michael. Those were excellent answers to those questions, and your tapes were incredible. Uh, we have a lot more questions. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to get to you, and I'll stick those in the mail Monday, and I'm sure you'll be busy answering those next week. Uh, I would point out to the callers, uh, we really appreciate those questions, but you need to give us your name and address because if we can't answer them during the program, we will answer them afterwards. Uh, we're going to move right along. Uh, we have another segment now produced by Joe Morris at Iowa State University, and it deals with uh, a species of fish, hybrid striped bass. We've done some work with here at Purdue, so now let's take a look at that video. bass has long been used as a food fish. However, as commercial catches declined, markets for aquaculture produced striped bass and their hybrids were developed. The first hybrid produced was a cross between female striped bass and a male white bass. This cross was first produced in 1965 in South Carolina. The reciprocal hybrid, a cross between a male striped bass and a female white bass, has become more popular over the last few years. This is primarily because a male striped bass can fertilize many female white bass, and the female white bass is much easier to handle. Hybrid striped bass growth and survival requirements include dissolved oxygen at a level of at least two parts per million. The optimal level is six to 12 parts per million. Optimal water temperature is 77 to 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Water quality parameters outside the preferred range will often lead to stresses and ultimately to disease. Unless otherwise noted, the information given here will focus on the reciprocal cross. Wild broodstock is usually obtained unless the culturist has domesticated broodstock. Fish may be collected by shocking, with hook and line, or by net. With all methods, stress must be kept to a minimum to enhance the chances for successful spawning. Striped bass males are sexually mature at two years, while females become mature at three years of age. White bass males and females both mature at two years of age. The egg characteristics of the two species differ. Striped bass eggs are larger and not as adhesive as the white bass eggs. The preferred water temperature for spawning is 61 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Eggs are fertilized with sperm from several males to ensure fertilization. The fertilized eggs are gently stirred with a brush or feather while sticky. Materials such as fuller's earth, silt, clay, or tannic acid may be used to reduce adhesiveness. Once the eggs harden, they are then placed into hatching jars. Each jar holds one to 200,000 eggs. The eggs will hatch in 40 to 48 hours, depending on water temperature. When the larvae hatch, they do not have mouth openings, but do have yolk sacs and oral globules for nutrition. Four to eight days after hatching, the yolk sac and oral globule will be assimilated. The mouth opening will be developed and the swim bladder inflated. However, in intensive inside tank culture, swim bladders may not be inflated at this point, which limits maneuverability of the fish. Fry may be stocked into culture ponds at this stage. Prior to stocking fry into culture ponds, the ponds must be fertilized. There is no single recipe for good fertilizing practices. The main goal is to produce adequate numbers of invertebrates to feed the hybrid striped bass fry. Three to four weeks should pass between pond flooding and fry stocking for the original cross. Wait one to two weeks for the reciprocal cross. The difference in waiting periods is necessary because the original cross fry have larger mouths than the reciprocals and can consume the larger invertebrates that are present later. The culture periods are often divided into three phases. In phase one, the fish are cultured for 30 to 45 days and are one to two inches in length when harvested. Although fry consume the numerous invertebrates in ponds, it is often a good idea to start feeding them early in the culture period. 
A good survival rate at harvest for the original cross is 40 to 50 percent, while only 10 to 25 percent survival can be expected for reciprocals. In phase two production, the fish from phase one are graded to obtain uniform size, then restocked into larger production ponds. At harvest in the fall, 80 to 85 percent survival and individual fish weighing approximately four ounces can be expected. Phase three production, the production of food fish, uses fish from the other two phases. These fish are harvested when they reach one to one and a half pounds, usually in the following fall if started as large fingerlings in the spring. Production and market values vary widely depending upon region and markets. The 1992 production level was approximately seven million pounds. It's a, uh, I would say, a very high risk venture. Uh, um, you know, I would say there's a future in it, uh, maybe more for stocking in lakes and ponds, uh, possibly a food fish market. Uh, our growing season, like anything else in the Midwest, is going to you know, you know, slow that down some. But uh, it, it's a good fish. It takes to feed real well. Uh, they're you know, on pellets just immediately. And uh, that's a real plus, I think. And, Thanks, Joe, for that videotape, and uh, Myron, I'd like to come visit your farm sometime. Looks like you uh, know all about spawning hybrid striped bass. Uh, we're going to move on to our next videotape. Uh, we have a lot of information for you today, and that's why we're, we're moving pretty quickly with these videotapes. We are getting more questions, and just to remind you again, that number is 800-743-4647. Uh, uh, you can call any time during the program. Uh, we can stockpile these questions and feed them out to the people who need to answer them afterwards. We will take some for the, during the program. Uh, our next videotape segment is going to be from Michigan. Uh, Don Garling at Michigan State uh, has been working with uh, Bayport Aquaculture and they raise yellow perch. So now let's, let's see our videotape on yellow perch. You've got your dairy farms, you've got your hog farms. Nothing extraordinary about those. They look pretty much the same no matter where you are. But here's a farm you've never seen before. Doesn't even look like a farm, does it? But it is a perch farm. It's the newest and largest in the state, and one of only a handful you'll find in Michigan. We would be definitely be the largest perch producer in the state, and... Um, we like to think that we're probably one of the larger, if not the largest, perch hatchery in the country simply because uh, there's just not a whole, whole lot of people who are doing what we're trying to do. Primarily, we're selling to fish processors at this point. Welcome to the world of aquaculture. Three years ago, this operation was nothing more than a demonstration facility to find out whether yellow perch could be trained to eat an artificial diet. Today, it's a commercial enterprise with a production capability of between 100 and 120,000 pounds of fish a year. This project started as a, a unique almost um, combination of uh, uh, cooperation between the power plant, a commercial uh, enterprise, Bayport Aquaculture, and uh, Michigan State University. The cooperation led to the obtaining of a grant from the National Science Foundation. That grant led to further research that was funded by the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center. Perch farming may one day take the place of the Great Lakes declining commercial perch fishing industry. Right now there's much less yellow perch commercial fishing going on than there has been due to regulations limiting commercial catch and allocating that to uh, recreational catch instead. And as a result, there is a demand there for a product that cannot be harvested at high enough levels to meet the market demand. One of the reasons why perch farms don't dot the Michigan countryside the way traditional farms do is because these little fellas thrive in warm water. Imagine the cost of keeping perch in 70 degree water in outdoor raceways 12 months a year in Michigan. Chilling thought, isn't it? So how did these guys do it? With the help of a friendly neighbor. We like to maintain our water temperatures anywhere from 68 to 70, 71 degrees. Um, and by locating here at the power plant, tapping into their uh, heated discharge water, we can do that um, pretty much throughout the year. Three years from now, Bayport Aquaculture would like to be producing one million pounds a year and processing the fish in its own facility. 
think there's a great potential for uh, yellow perch aquaculture, especially here in the upper Midwest. Um, we we get a lot of inquiries into our operation because there is a high demand for the fish itself. Um, we still have a few hurdles that we need to overcome before we can really get into a, a large-scale operation. In many fish farms, one of the highest cost items is feed, so if we can improve the feed even further and reduce its cost or improve the efficiency at which those fish grow based on the feed that we're feeding them, then we should be able to help reduce costs and increase the profitability. Perch require much less protein and less energy in their feeds than rainbow trout and um, even to some extent the channel catfish, which will enable the production of perch diets that will be less costly to make than the trout diets and improve the profitability of an operation like this. Also those diets, since they are um, basically formulated for the yellow perch, we'll get a perch that is lean, good muscle fish as opposed to some of the trout diets which are higher in protein and higher in energy and not as well balanced for the perch produces a fish that's a, it's a little fattier. One hurdle the company faces as it expands is the development of a more consistent supply of fingerlings. Nobody has really figured out a way to uh, grow newly hatched yellow perch fry right on an artificial diet. And so what our approach was to the whole problem is that we would maintain them uh, maintain the newly hatched perch in farm ponds up until they're between one and two inches long. At that point, we can bring them from the ponds into our facility and train them to accept the pelleted diet. The primary thing in the ponds, though, is learning how to manage those ponds so that the right amount of the right size feed for the perch is there when it needs to be. We understand the technology. What we need to do is improve upon that so that we can maximize the fingerlings produced per surface acre of water. Um, and once we do that and we have our own series of, of um, good ponds, then we'll be able to increase our fingerling production and then that would lead to an uh, increase in blowout potential and uh, um, we would expand our facility here at this site. Thanks, Don. This is a real good videotape. Uh, our next videotape is going to be on rainbow trout production uh, and Atlantic salmon, so it, we'll call it salmon production out in Nebraska. Before we see that videotape, I'd like to try to answer one of the questions that a caller from Tuscaloosa, Alabama uh, had. Uh, his name is Mr. Wayne Ford. Uh, the question he had was, is floating or sinking feed best, uh, and what's the difference between the two in terms of cost? I think this last videotape illustrated the differences. I know the catfish farmers down south and even here in the Midwest tend to use a floating catfish food. Uh, it's better primarily for a management strategy. It's a little bit more expensive than the sinking. But the yellow perch feed that Bayport uses is a sinking feed, to best of my knowledge. And that's pretty common among the perch producers that we see starting up here in the Midwest because they're a little bit shyer than the catfish. And so they tend to feed more of a sinking feed. So I hope that answers your question. Floating feed is more expensive, though. Uh, okay, our next videotape, like I said, is on rainbow trout production, and uh, Terry Case from University of Nebraska has produced this for us. If you travel around Nebraska, one thing you're likely to notice is that Nebraskans move a lot of water. Nebraska is rich in water, especially groundwater. In fact, the groundwater resources in Nebraska are among the largest in North America. And a major part of that water is in the Nebraska sand hills, underlying nearly 20,000 square miles of some of the finest grazing land in the world. The essential elements for trout production are large amounts of water, good water quality, and intensive management. At the Sand Hills Aqua Farm near Keystone, Nebraska, over 6,000 gallons of water per minute pass through a series of trout production raceways. A unique feature of Sand Hills Aqua Farm are these stream cleaners at the head of the raceways. The stream cleaners are there basically just to remove the large debris, the aquatic vegetation or 
and or sticks or trash that may come along with the water. Uh, from there, then the water goes into the head box area, and then uh, it's evenly proportioned down each set of raceways. There's, so there'd be approximately 1,500 gallons a minute going down each race. Raceways are sized so the velocity of the water flushes waste and uneaten food out of the system. The wastes collect in sumps at the ends of the raceways and are pumped out at least once a week into a settling basin. The configuration in the settling basin is such that we're able to let the water stand for approximately two hours and then uh, that water then can be drained off and returned to the creek, leaving the settable solids in that basin area. Now, as a fish farmer, we do want to protect our natural resources uh, so we do have a uh, sincere interest in uh, environmental protection. Oxygen is the first limiting factor in trout culture and controls the amount of fish you can produce. The traditional approach to maintaining dissolved oxygen levels in raceways is to construct them in series with drops between them to aerate the water. Another more modern approach to optimizing dissolved oxygen is to inject pure oxygen when operational, this low head oxygenation system injects pure oxygen into the water at a rate of about four liters per minute in each raceway. The oxygen is absorbed by the water as it moves through the perforated screens in this system. Using aeration or oxygen addition, the water in the raceways can be used five or six times until ammonia excreted by the trout reaches levels that limit production. The single greatest challenge in the trout business is marketing. Mike live hauls his trout to private fishing operations, primarily in Colorado, or to custom processing plants. One plant is located near Lisco, Nebraska. We cut our first fish in the fall of 90. At that time, we hired a lady from Oregon who had managed a processing house. Coldwater Fish Farms is presently raising salmon but processes both salmon and trout. Here, coho salmon are being processed for the national market. When the fish come into the processing house, the first people that get a hold of them, their job is to cut around the gills, cut the tongue loose, and open the belly. And then they're washed down a tube to the next stage where people wash the insides out. Uh, after they've gone through the cleaning process, uh, they go into the boning room where each fish is weighed uh, prior to boning to determine whether it will be in an 8-ounce category, which is 7 to 9, or a 10-ounce category, which is 9 to 11. Then the fish go through quality control. Never had a complaint on our product. The people in quality control are looking for miscuts, uh, poor color, bones, uh, ragged-looking fish, anything that might... Uh, make it not a number one product. After processing, the fish are shipped in gel pack containers. Most of our product goes uh, towards the east, all over the country, uh, south into Texas, Chicago, Minneapolis, all the states, and in the southeast also.